good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Sorry for the hiatus. Obviously, there's been a lot of COVID issues that have hit the PN Hospital, and we are starting to see a little bit of a respite, thank goodness. So it's time to start up Advanced Echo Teaching again. Um, and it's great to start that with Dr. Benny Samadi. Thanks for joining us, Benny. Uh, Benny's still in maternity leave with a second baby. Congratulations again on that. And uh, so it's really great of you to help us out and welcome us back to advanced echo teaching and uh, it's going to be on asds thank you very very much thanks sam okay so i'm going to talk about asds i had given this talk um last year and i added a few extra tidbits um hopefully my drawing skills have improved since then um so i haven't got this on presentation mode because i want to flip between a few really good websites that are great resources and also to draw um, um, the anatomy. So ASDs, when to suspect an ASD. So there are some clinical signs, but the main one that I want to draw your attention to is an un, uh, is right heart enlargement with no clear cause on an echo. And then you should really go hunting for an ASD. So ASD is cause right heart enlargement, right atrium, and then right ventricle, and then really severe advanced disease. You might get some pulmonary hypertension. Um, but um, the important distinction is VSDs cause left heart dilation. So it's just ASDs with right heart dilation and, and you should go hunting for an ASD. Um, there's a little paper I found which actually details the steps quite nicely um, about, uh, you know, what, what you should be looking for in the sequence of your thinking um, when you're doing an echo. So you see this right heart enlargement, um, then you go looking for the, the, the ASD determinate size, the shunt direction, look for associated features. Um, and I'll list the common associated features with each ASD uh, in a minute and, um, and then determine suitability for device closure and we'll just briefly go over that one too. So uh, we're just going to touch briefly on embryology for any of this to make sense. Um, and it all happens in the quite early on in the first month or so of um, development and uh, if you remember your embryology, which I didn't before studying any of this stuff, um, the, the heart is basically one long tube um, and it, it folds over on itself. Um, you can see my mouse. Yeah, um, it folds over on itself to form the primitive ventricles and primitive atria. And from this diagram, I'll just draw your attention to the, what's called the sinus phenosis, because that's one of the ASDs we'll talk about later. Um, so, um, and then this image is really just to demonstrate that, that, that the venous structures are, it's, it's just a mess. So it's not hard to see how various attachments and pl the, the plumbing might go wrong in, um, in the development of the heart. So, um, interestingly, only the first two ASDs that I'm going to talk about are true defects in the atrial septum. So the primum and secundum ASDs. And then the other two that I'll talk about are coronary sinus and um, sinus venosus ASDs. And they're actually not, they're, they're more like um, uh, plumbing issues going wrong with the venous circulation during development. So um, here's a diagram out of the, the ASC guidelines. Um, and which just describes the septum primum forming in picture A. So that comes down here and you have the ostium primum at the bottom here, which is situated just above the endocardial cushions. And the, this yellow thing here that forms, the, um, forms part of the valve, the atrioventricular valve. So the ostium primum is just above that. Now, when that fails to close, that's a primum ASD. Then, uh, oh, sorry. Then you get um, in picture B, just below it, you have um, perforations happening in the the uh, septum here, um, and then those perforations. Sorry, there's shortcuts built into my mouse. Very annoying. Um, those 
perforations go on to become the ostium secundum. Um, uh, now, just with the terminology, it can get quite confusing. Um, even though you have a septum primum and then the next septum to form to the right of that is the septum secundum, which is this one here, the ostium primum and the ostium secundum are both in the septum primum. So when we talk about secundum and primum, we're not talking about the septum. We're talking about the holes. The first hole, which is the one next to the valve, and the second hole, which um, is, forms your secundum ASD if it doesn't close over properly. Is that making sense so far? Clear as yeah, Benny, hey, hey, so say that one more time. So you've got the ostium primum and the ostium secundum. Yep. But the holes that come through it are all in the sept, all in the primum. Yep. And those two holes are called the ostium secundum and the ostium primum. Is that correct? Yes, ostium. Yes, correct. Thank so you. If I, I can't believe I keep forgetting these things. I don't know why I find it so difficult to get them stuck in my head. It took it took me a long time oh. to understand this because of the terminology. It's it's quite confusing. Yes, that's why we record these things so I can look. So if we have your primitive atria, um, I'm just going to ignore the ventricular side of things. So let's say you've got your um, cushion, endocardial cushions here. And you've got your, okay, so the first thing that happens is you have a septum, quite a thin septum that comes down like this and then stops there. Um, so this is your ostium, oh, let me make that a bit smaller. Ostium primum, right? Then, um, then that starts to close off. So that kind of starts to close off as you get perforations here. Because remember, we need we need some flow directly from the right atrium in the fetal circulation, right atrium to left atrium. So there always has to be some communication there in the fetus. Um, then you get Mr. Um, Green. <laughs> then you get your ostium secundum. Oh, sorry, your ostium secundum coming like this. And there's a gap here. Um, then- oh, Sorry, Ben, that was the septum secundum coming in. Sorry, yes, septum secundum, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> septum secundum coming to the right of the septum primum. Thanks. And then this needs to obliterate completely. So that ostium primum is gone. And you now have the ostium secundum. Does that make sense? So that's normal. So if um, this ostium primum fails to close over, you have a primum ASD. Right? So then when... Uh, When the fetus is born, you when the yeah when the fetus is born, you you actually need some sort of overlap here. Um, this kind of overlaps the the primum, um, the primum septum septum primum and the septum secundum need to overlap to fuse together. So that's going to fuse together and then create one. <laughs> Sorry, it's terrible, terrible drawing. Um, one uh, septum. But if this doesn't overlap enough, then you get um, a, a secundum ASD. If it overlaps but it doesn't fuse, that's a patent for amenovali. 
And the significance of that is the direction of shunting. So if this is overlapping here, which it is a bit here, you in the once the baby's born, your left-sided pressures go up. And hey, Benny, do you mind just making that bigger on your screen for us? Oh, yeah, sure. Are you able just to grab that and make the whole picture bigger? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. Okay. I can make a... Oh, do you have to draw it again? That's okay. I'll just uh, just quickly go over it again. Oh, sorry. That's right. Just so I can draw it bigger. Is that better? Or should I draw it even bigger? No, that's good. That was good. That was good. Wow, yeah. that's huge. <laughs> it's like I've got a really big screen, so it seems really big to me. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I won't change colors. I just do. Here's your like little endocardial cushions. Right. Then your septum primum coming down and your blood flow is going through here initially. Then uh, this starts to close off and you get perforations here. And then that becomes a hole. And you, at the same time, you have your septum secundum, and there's blood flow going through like this, through the foramen ovale in the fetus. When the baby's born, the left side, of, so this is the LA, RA, left side pressures go up. This flap fuses closed, goes over there. Um, and that's, your that's that's normal if it doesn't fuse but it overlaps like you have here you're still because your left side pressures are higher you're still going to have um uh no blood flow going through there until the right atrial pressures go up for whatever reason but if this flap hasn't formed properly then you just have a big gaping hole and there's nothing to overlap so you get um, a left to right shunt when the baby's born. Left side pressures go up, right? So um, if your ostium primum doesn't close, remember this is in 3D. You also get um, blood going that way. Uh, it looks like it's going through the septum there, but this is in 3D, so just remember that it doesn't. Um, it doesn't go over this, the septum secundum doesn't cover it. So that kind of brings us to the next point, um, which is, you know, if you if you have a patent frame in ovale, your your shunt direction is actually right to left. So you're right when your right side pressures go up, then you get a shunt right to left. For a patent for you can't have a left to right shunt with a patent for a ovale unless unless that whole septum's been stretched, which can happen if you get a very dilated heart disease. In more advanced stages, the whole thing will get stretched. So, um, so the most common one is the secundum ASD, and it's probably the easiest way to picture it. These two septums fuse, <clears throat> and you have um, blood flow like this through the secundum ASD. Um, does that make sense so far? Then it can ask. So then, if so, if someone has elevated right atrial pressures, like or greater than left atrium, then you wouldn't be able to pick between a. PFO and a secundum ASD because the flow is going to be right to left. And unless you can like identify it, because the, the, the shunt site will be the same, right? So you couldn't differentiate those two. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So I'll go over a few ways that you can differentiate them. That's true. But um, the, the thing is that with ASDs, you don't, um, 
you get right heart dilation, but if the pressure doesn't actually go up until it's really advanced, like really, 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 really advanced, and it would have been picked up by then. Even in adulthood, you would have picked up a hemodynamically significant um, ASD before the pressures go up. So you're usually looking for a left to right shunt. So what you're what you're describing is Eisenmenger physiology, yeah, yeah, and yeah. it would have to be really very severe from an ASD to, for that to happen. Okay. Um, it can happen, but I, I think it's very very unlikely, um, and very very uncommon, I should say. Um, whereas um, with a PFO, I guess um, you would. You would, ha you would have more of the clinical sequelae because it's the right to left shunt. So you can get the strokes and paradoxical emboli and that sort of thing and, and hypoxia and stuff. So with the left to right shunt, you don't get that many clinical signs um, until it's very advanced. So you would have hopefully picked it up. Does that make sense? Um, uh, so in a couple of other ways, since we're on the topic, a couple of other ways you can differentiate a PFO from a secundum ASD is because they are basically in the, in the same, same place, um, other than the shunt direction is the size. So um, the, the smaller ASDs will close spontaneously. So um, most of the ASDs less than eight millimeters will have closed spontaneously. So if it's small, it's more likely to be a PFO. Does that make sense? And then the other thing is that the, your PFO doesn't cause those hemodynamic changes with the right heart dilation. So you only get that with your secundum, your, with your ASDs, with your, with your secundum ASD in this case. So those are ways that you can differentiate them. Make sense? Clear as mud. Um, so, uh, I'll just finish talking about those two because they're probably the most common. So the secundum ASD is, I've said 60% here, but some people say 80%. Vast majority of the ASDs you're going to see is going to be secundum. And all of the ones that I saw when I, when I was at the PA looking at um, cases and things like that for, for these presentations were all secundum. Um, and the best view for the, that is the ethical four chamber view. And it's right in the middle. Now the, the, the morphology of that um, secundum ASD can be quite variable. It can be big, small, um, in various shapes. It might not be one confluent um, hole. It might be the little perforations if it's arrested in this stage. It could be little perforations. So you see multiple jets in that, in that case. Um, but as in the middle of the um, atrial septum. Um, and just going back to the primum ASDs, the best view to see that in is subcostal four chamber. Um, it's in the inferior portion of the intraatrial septum. And I said 30% there, but really it's probably less than that. Um, and um, the primum ASDs are actually on a continuum of congenital heart disorders called atrioventricular canal deflex or atrioventricular septal defects, um, which involves um, the, the primum ASD malformation of the atrioventricular valves to the point where there might just be one combined atrioventricular valve with no discernible mitral or tricuspid, and then a VSD right below it associated with that. So that kind of that crux of the heart is malformed um, and they become quite complex congenital heart diseases. So if you do see a primum ASD, it's important to go looking for all those associated, possible associated features. Um, so with the um, next two, the sinusinosis ASD and the coronary sinus ASD, the, they're actually not true deficiencies in the atrial septum. So um, the sinus venosis AST, there's a, um, there you go. there's a superior type and an inferior type. So your, if your, your SVC kind of comes in there. 
your IVC comes in here. Um, what they describe with the um, superior and inferior type is a really a malformation of the veins joining onto the atria. Um, and that's mostly the pulmonary veins. So you have the pulmonary veins coming into your left atrium. And the most common one is your superior type um, sinus venosus defect with at the superior vena cava. And that's described as actually your venous pulmonary, your pulmonary vein, this um, right upper one, this one, because it's the closest one. It actually forms a little bit um, over to the to the right and then um, this SVC forms a little bit more over here and sometimes it can even straddle the intraatrial septum and that becomes your connection or the pulmonary vein will join onto the SVC and that will become your connection of shunting of blood from the left atrium to the right atrium. Um, so there's a few different types um, and then a similar thing happens with the lower pulmonary veins and the uh, IVC going um, um, forming a connection with the left atrium. Um, and when you see this one on echo the superior type is the most common when you see that on echo it does look quite quite look like your the SVC sitting on top of the intraatrial septum. But the intraatrial septum itself hasn't malformed in any way. It's, it's, um, it's normal. Um, it's more the venous connections are the problem. Um, and you get shunting of, of blood um, either from the left atrium to the SVC and therefore the right atrium or directly from the pulmonary Thing before it even reaches the left atrium. Um, and then the coronary sinus. Um, so the coronary sinus, it, it drains into the right atrium, but its course is around the, if you remember your anatomy, it's, it, it goes all the way around the, it, it sits in the interventricular interventricular groove no the the groove between the left atrium and the left ventricle it runs along that groove um and in a in a coronary sinus asd you just basically the wall of the left atrium and the coronary sinus isn't there so and it can be com the whole thing and that's a completely unroofed coronary sinus asd or it can just be perforations so then you get like Sorry, the other way around. Going into the right atrium from directly from the left atrium. Um, so that's a um, coronary sinus defect. Uh, again, not a true defect in the atrial, in the atrial septum. Um, the last two that I just talked about are very rare. Um, the sinus venosus ASD, as you can see from my crappy drawing, um, is often associated with anomalous pulmonary venous connections. So you have more abnormalities of the pulmonary vein connections. Um, and the coronary sinus ASD can be associated with a persistent left-sided SVC. Um, and uh, the best way to test that was with the bubble study in the left arm. Um, and then you'll be able to say that they're all associated with right-sided chamber dilation. Yes, they're all associated with right-sided chamber dilation. And uh, with the exception of PFOs, that's why I don't really include PFOs here. And um, recently I actually stumbled across um, a lot of lectures on this sort of stuff. And there's a new ASD that they've discovered in the last few years called a vestibular ASD. Um, and it sits like just um, inferior and anterior to the secundum, where a secundum ASD would be, but it's in the muscular portion. So they've found that this is a new distinct ASD that's in the muscular portion of the 
intraatrial septum, another, a, a true septal defect, and um, it's not a secundum ASD because the it's in the muscular portion, not in the um, not where the foramen ovale is. That makes sense. Anyway, it, it's been misdiagnosed as secundum ASD apparently all this time. I thought it was interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is just, uh, just showing you the guidelines which describe um, all the different different ASDs and also how to image them on transdorsic and uh, toe. Um, here's the um, the picture from the guidelines. So you have a superior type sinus phenosis, inferior type right sinus phenosis, secundum right in the middle, your um, primum ASD right above the atrioventricular valves and an unroofed coronary sinus. Um, is that all making sense so far? Yeah, better than ever. It's really cool, especially the drawing is excellent. Um, so when you report, so the vast majority of the ASDs you're going to see are going to be secundum ASDs. Probably the only <laughs> ASDs you're going to pick are going to be secundum ASDs because if we say of all the congen adult congenital heart disease you see, up to 10% is atrial septal defects. And then so for the other, for the rarer type, we're talking about like less than 1% um, of congenital heart disease. So, um, yeah, probably won't see that. But when you do see a secundum, um, what, the, what you need to do is assess the distance or how much of a rim you have. And the way that they label this, if you can see this diagram, is, is based on the structure. So the aortic valve is here. So that's the aortic valve rim um, or the SVC rim or the IVC rim or the posterior wall rim or the right upper pulmonary vein rim. So what you're trying to say is how far it is, how, what the distance is to each structure. And, and I, I think 3D really comes in here. 3D toe especially gives you a really nice definition of the, um, uh, of the defect um, and its orientation and, and how big it is and, and whether it's just one or multiple perforations. The reason why you need to describe the rims um, is you need at least five millimeters for your um, device closure. Uh, and if you don't have a sufficient rim, then there's a possibility for it to either erode into that structure that it's too close to, which actually is very rare, um, or embolize if, if, if you just don't have the right, um, if it's too big and you don't have enough rim anywhere. Um, so, so again, this one just out of the guidelines, just describing that it can be small, large, and various shapes. Um, this is from a pediatric congenital heart disease textbook um, that I like because it has online um, videos. Um, unfortunately, with pediatric echoes, they do this sector upside down and they image anatomically, so it's a bit difficult to follow, but the images are labeled here. So if, you, if you're a little bit disoriented, don't worry, that's normal. So we have um, a secundum atrial septal defect here, and it's just showing the right atrium, the right ventricle. Um, the left atrium here, the aorta, and the secundum here. Um, and in your bicable view, so this is a bicable view, you have your SVC, IVC, and your, um, uh, your secundum ASD right in the middle there. And there's a Doppler view as well. Um, and here we have a toe showing um, a PFO. Uh, with a lot of mobility. So there's this very mobile kind of flap here. It's um, thin and stretched out. That is um, what, we, what you would call aneurysmal. And for it to be considered an aneurysmal intraatrial septum, there are measurement um, criteria. I think it's 10 across, so from the... Um, 
this border to this border, and then coming out um, would be 15 millimetres. So if it hits those criteria, then it's an aneurysm. And the reason why I mention that is because if you see a mobile aneurysm or endotracheal septum, they're often associated with secundum ASD. So you should be looking for a secundum ASD in that case. Um, and here is, uh, this is an intracardiac echo, which I thought was kind of cool because we don't do them. Um, so here's your right atrium, left atrium. And, and again, you can see a secundum ASD there. Um, and the shunt direction, right? Going from left atrium to right atrium. And here's your device. So they've put an implant, so it looks like there, I think. Um, all making sense so far? I think, I, I think it's important to mention that with, when you do a bubble study, because it's a left to right shunt, look for that negative, I think it's called negative contrast, that sign where you have um, the deficiency of the bubbles in the right atrium because you have um, blood shunting from the left atrium. Is that what it's called, Sam? Yeah, I find it really hard. I don't know about anyone else, particularly, I guess, you know, you see the examples in talks or textbooks and all the heart rates slow and they've just got these perfect bubbles and everything <laughs> yeah. looks great and it's easy. And then in real life, I find often you've got the patient a little bit tachycardic or even, you know, if you don't have the most perfect bubbles, it's really tricky. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's where I think it's, it's good to do the, um, you know, the blood, just getting a little bit of blood in this, in the saline with a little bit of air and then you agitate that and then you get the most amazing bubbles right so you, i think if you're looking for negative contrast you've got to have blood in your agitated saline yeah yeah um yeah I, yeah i agree with you i think it's really hard and it's really important to do the provocation tests as well because you, you can get i think i think with asds there's a high rate of false negatives because of the shunt direction so it's hard to pick up on a bubble study um so it's important to do some provocation tests to try and reverse a shunt yeah and toes i'm finding the uh, the diagnosis of asds on tte is is sometimes a bit dodgy right I think you're right, the false negative rate's high yes. and sometimes yeah. false positive as well. I think you need transesophageal echo and provocation manoeuvres and good contrast. Yeah, definitely. I should have mentioned, sorry, with the with the first two, the primum and the secundum ASDs, you, you can pick those up on a um, transthoracic echo fairly reliably because it should fall into your normal views, um, into your regular four chamber views. But the, the sinus phenosis type and the current, the, the sinus phenosis type in particular is very hard to pick. Um, you just can't get good views of the, like the SVC especially, um, and the pulmonary veins on a trans, trans thoracic. It can be, you know, with your, your depth issues, once you get to the pulmonary veins, it can be quite hard to actually see the walls there. Um, and then the coronary sinus, you're, it's hard to pick the actual, um, def deficiency defect in the wall, but the clue is that the coronary sinus is very dilated from on the left side of SVC. So that um, might be a clue. And then you can do a bubble study through the left arm. And if it goes into the coronary sinus first, then you know that you've got a connection between your left arm, the left SVC, and left and, and the current going directly into your coronary sinus. Um, if you see the bubbles in the coronary sinus before anywhere else. So yeah, I think, I think it's quite hard to pick um, uh, in general and then, but the, the first two should be easier. Um, so where were we up to click on that one? Uh, this one. Okay, so, um, so this is a primum ASD. This is um, actually a, um, partial atrioventricular canal defect because the valves aren't normal. Um, but you can see that the, the deficiency is just really close to the valve. So here's a left atrium, right atrium, here are your valves. This is actually a common atrioventricular valve. 
Um, but it's right there, it's right next to it. There is no septum, um, there's nothing, there's no structure above, above it, above the valve for the septum to even attach to. Um, here's another um, uh, example of a ASD. So this one's a coronary sinus and this is unroofed. So you can see from, so there's a toe, left atrium, left ventricle, and the coronary sinus is here. We've all seen the coronary sinus on the echo, right? Um, and then you, the completely unroofed type, there's no boundary between the left atrium and the coronary sinus. And again, you can see the shunt direction on the color Doppler here. Ah, oh, sorry, mouse is terrible. Um, and you can see the, the, the arrow pointing to the defect and the left to right shunting on this one as well. And, and I, uh, the other thing I'll just draw your attention to is how big that coronary sinus is, really big. Um, and this is not going to play. Maybe if I go. There we go. So this is from the lab at Echo, at Nepean, the Echo lab at Nepean. <laughs> um, what do you think of that? Uh, Louise, do you want to maybe have a have a go? Secundum ASD. Yeah, good. <laughs> it's always secundum. It's always secundum. Okay, do you want to just take us through why? So because it's in the middle of the interatrial septum, the shunt is from the left to the right. Um, yeah. And the... There is enlargement of the right atrium, but I can't see much enlargement of the right ventricle. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think on this view, it's probably a bit high, but I, I'd agree with you. I think that right atrium is probably a bit large. And what do you think of the number of jets? There's at mm. least two jets. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think in that one plane, at least there's two. So it's probably multiple jets. Um, so this is that perforated type of, uh, secundum ASD and it just means that the that um, in, in the embryological stage instead of even becoming a full ostium it's arrested at that perforated stage cool good work you're going to show us the post exercise we want to see an exercise <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that one sorry <laughs> Um, oh, and some other, yeah, the other, other one I'll just mention okay. briefly is the Gabode, Gabode, Gabode defect, which is... Um, oh, no, 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 who, someone's got to tell you. Okay. Ben or Louise? I've never heard of it. Ben? Yeah, I have no idea. Oh, no. Okay. oh really? Oh. A good one, it's a cracker. Uh, yeah, 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 Gabode defect. So the Gabode defect is a defect from, in the, in the membranous part of the in a ventricular septum, which actually crosses over to the atrium as well. So it's, um, you get a communication between your right atrium and your left ventricle. Um, so you get blood shunting, obviously from the left ventricle to the right atrium. And uh, that's uh, not, that's kind of uh, in a gray zone. It's not exactly in um, ASD, it's not exactly a VSD. Um, and they can occur, they can be congenital or acquired. So you can get them, um, uh, they can be part of your congenital heart, heart disease or um, a surgical um, post-surgery. Sometimes they can um, accidentally make a hole there um, and uh, with like bowel surgeries, for example. And then I think infective endocarditis is another one. And Sam, have you seen them in any other? Um, no, I've, I've only ever seen it personally in infective endocarditis. Uh, with you know horrible staph infections, unrecognized abscesses forming, and then getting some horrible communication between a ventricle aortic root and into the right atrium. 
needing so, medical procedures and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So if your ventricular septum comes down, then if you remember the muscular part only starts a little bit um, away away. I'll just get rid of these. These endocardial cushions. Um, and then you kind of get a, a so the valves are not at the same level. I guess that's the important thing to recognize about the anatomy. So the tricuspid valve is more apical, apically placed, so down that way, than the mitral valve. And then you get you if you have a communication there, you can. Uh, that's your Gobodi defect here. Um, and that's actually how. Um, just an interesting bit of trivia. That's how you recognize congenitally your right ventricle and your left ventricle is actually by the valve that's attached to it. And I was very confused by that for the longest time before I learned about Epstein's anomaly, where the um, leaflets don't peel off the ventricle properly. So that's why you, you can have every, every kind of arrangement of atria, veins, arteries, pulmonary artery, aorta, um, and, and ventricles, you can have any kind of arrangement, everything exists. The only thing that's constant is that the tricuspid valve is always on the right ventricle and the mitral valve is always on the left ventricle. And that's because the leaflets peel off from the ventricular muscle. That's on the anatomical right ventricle and anatomical. An anatomical, yes, anatomical. And that's how they identify on congenital heart disease, regardless of where it's positioned. Um, okay, and then let's see. Yeah, so here we have a patent foramen ovale. Um, it's just to show you that flap, that, that flap, um, which is essential to visualize that flap when you're assessing for a patent for a ovale on a toe. You want to get this part of the, um, the septum. And then you can see some nice color in the bottom image as well going through showing that it's still patent. Uh, and uh, this one is the example of the stretched PFO that I was talking about. So you don't have um, the, the, the septum, um, the flap kind of um, is kind of been stretched out. Um, so that can look like a secundum ASD, but again, some of the other uh, things that I talked about to differentiate them would come in handy there. Um, and then things that you want to assess on echo, kind of mention this briefly, but um, uh, you want to do your chamber sizes, your PA pressure. Um, look for the associated anomalies that we talked about as well. Um, that's really important. And um, the type size um, and the margins uh, do some measurements as well if it's a secundum to see if it's appropriate for device closure. You can actually close the sinus venosus types with, with um, stents now as well. Um, that's, I'm not very familiar with it, but it's possible. Um, and associate, look for not just associated congenital defects, but also associated, um, so, you, so you can get sequelae. So if, if, for example, if the right heart stretched, then the annulus of the tricuspid valve will stretch and you can get some regurge there. That's kind of important to note. Um, and then the other one I came across um, in, uh, lectures for, for congenital heart disease and mitral stenosis. So because the left atrium is offloading onto the right atrium through this ASD, you might not actually be able to pick very well a mitral stenosis. And then once you close the ASD, it can unmask that and the patient goes into pulmonary edema. So it's important just to have a really good look at the valves to make sure that, that you know what you're getting into and whether it's appropriate to close that or not. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, so there's just a note about QPQS. So um, te technically, technically, in theory, you're supposed to do a QPQS, which is looking at flow, looking at the, the stroke volumes through the 
the pulmonary artery and the, the, the aortic valve um, and doing a comparison of the, the stroke volumes and the flow to get a ratio. And if you have a ratio 1.5, then that's hemodynamically significant. Um, and the, the Q stands for flow, the P is pulmonary and the S is systemic. So in an in a ASD, you would be getting increased flow through your pulmonary circulation. So if it's one, more than one and a half, one and a half or more times the systemic circulation, then that's significant. The problem is that it's very difficult to, to measure. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know what your experience is with this, Sam, but every time I've tried to do it, it gives me a crazy number. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the magic number is 1.5. It's always brought up in every exam. Someone always mentions QPQS, talking to the guys that do congenital disease for a living they say don't use it it's complete rubbish it doesn't work it's not useful it's much better to be looking at dilated heart chamber sizes to be honest mm -hmm. i think to know whether it's significant or not so yeah I, I, it's not it's not recommended it's mainly because the right side is really hard to get an accurate um an accurate estimation of what the stroke volume is on the right side because if you think that the lvot is probably not circular all the time it's probably more oval shaped the right side definitely is so it's not a circle. So even if you're measuring a diameter, it can be different in the orthogonal plane. So it's just, it's not, they, they certainly say it's not super useful. But 1.5 is a magic number for exams. I think, I think they can do it on, can they do it on cardiac MRI? Oh, they can do it, sorry, that, that's different. Okay, sorry, then yeah. cardiac MR, yeah, then, then that can be useful and they can get super accurate stroke volumes of cardiac yeah. MR. I'm just talking about echocardiography. Yeah, yeah. So I think like when, when let's talk, we're talking about us and, you know, I wouldn't bother doing it. It's a lot of, it's time consuming and it's calculations and it's not accurate on echo. And if you really, really need one by that point, they're probably going to be getting a CT and a cardiac MRI anyway. So they can go do it on that. <laughs> that's that's probably a better way of doing that if they really need can I, it. Can I just ask something then? If, if um, flow through the right side is difficult to assess, what about pulmonary VTI, just pulmonary VTI and not using the cross-sectional area? But you, don't, you, you can't then compare the VTI because the RVOT has a bigger diameter. Because the VTI of the right side of the heart is normally about 16, whereas the VTI of the left side of the heart is normally closer to 20, 22. And that's because you've got different sized chambers. And that's why you can't just compare the VTI because if you're going to just compare that, you've got to presume that the area is the same. What about the VTI, pulmonary VTI, and then the mitral VTI? Again, I think it's. No, you need a volume. Thing. You need a volume. Yeah. You need a three. You need a three D. Three. You might have that VTI, the distance that the blood travels. You need to know what the the volume of that blood is. Yeah. So I don't think you can just do that. Unfortunately, It'd be nice though. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking like I yeah, I don't think I think you need that that three-dimensional measure. Which is why Kaya Kamara is so good. Yeah. You can cut it in any plane they like. Okay, accurate volume estimation. Um, so a couple of things you can look up this talk by Ruth Ram. She's um, amazing. Which I thought yeah. was really good. Yeah. She's yeah. phenomenal. Um, we we get her to talk at the race kids that we ran once in pre-COVID times. And we will hopefully run again. So it's a, a whole course that's on, you know, two-day course on congenital heart disease, for in, particularly in kids. It's called Race Kids. And she talks on that, and she's just amazing. She gets you to do uh, embryology with a towel. So you're actually similar to your drawings, you know, how well it sort of just conceptually makes sense when you look at your drawings. She does the same thing with actual when you have a towel, sort of with different elastic bands. It's very good. I thought about whipping something up with balloons and... Um like a parent of small children. Yeah. <laughs> you Plastic clean and pipe cleaners next, please. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> um so a couple of other things that I'll I just these are all free. So basic guidelines are free. There are some videos associated with those guidelines you can look up. Um these talks are free. And I'll just mention the, these guys. So this is who I was talking about, Prof, Prof, Professor Ho, Professor yeah. Yen Ho. She does this 
talk on um, ASDs. I've seen, seen her do it a few times. She's so good at it. And she has um, like uh, cadaveric specimens with the defects to wow. show you. And she puts like a pen through the defect and it just makes it very, very clear. Um, and uh, she, yeah, really knows the stuff. She's from the Bront Brompton and- um, Are these the guys that do, there's the, every year, I think there's an amazing uh, conference on uh, grown up congenital heart disease. I think it's out of the Brompton in the UK, and it's meant to be unbelievable. Yeah, I think they might be because I, I think I, I think I attended the webinar version of that during COVID. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so this is free. You, you just need to sign up with an account, which is free, and then you can get. Um, I'll just go back so you can see how I got to this because they've got a whole education page now. Um, so his structural heart interventions, that's what I was looking at. Um, and it's a whole, all, it's not just congenital heart disease, it's all sorts of cardiology talks um, and echo talks. It's awesome. Um, yeah, here we go. So if you just Google World Brompton and how do I pronounce it? Harefield? Harefield, yeah. yeah. Harefield yeah. Hospital. Um, and then you go down, that's the, you go to for healthcare professionals and then you go down to the education page. They've got a whole separate web page now. Um, so that's where I was on and you make an account and you can get all these free lectures. Um, and then the other one I want to tell you about is these guys, the European Society of Cardiology. They've got online, um, again, free uh, learning modules. A couple of them are free. One of the ones that is free is what they call growing up congenital heart disease. Um, you got to, again, make an account with them, which is free, and then join ACVC, Acute uh, Cardiovascular Care, um, the subgroup, again, free, and then you'll have access to a couple of courses, and one of them is this, and, um, like, uh, it gives you this information. So uh, look, there's, like, one on atriceptal defects, and then you go through, and it has, like, a radiology, ECG, echo, and cardiac MR associated with um, the primum secundum and sinus venosus uh, um, defects. Um, they do a whole, all the, like, a, a whole bunch of congenital heart disease, but I thought that was pretty good. And that's free as well, so. <laughs> Did I mention it's free? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's like loads of resources out there that you, know, you can use and they're really good. So that would, would be my recommendations. Bernie, that was gold. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thanks, Bernie. No worries. Thanks, when are you going to do VSDs? Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. So that reminds me, I'm down for next week for VSDs, but I can't do it next week. I can do it the week after that. No problem. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Because if it's anything like that, that kind of sticks in my brain. It's fantastic. Take no, the drawing. I, um, I promise I'm going to improve the drawing. It was so bad. Oh, no. <laughs> it was fantastic. So it, was cool. it, it, it made sense. And it's, it's, it's perfect. It doesn't have to be ideal. I was wondering whether we could actually get one of the, um, you know, the web designer here. Maybe she could try and draw one up, uh, get a cartoon going for you. Yeah. But I, I do kind I, of like it's actually my like to-do list to learn how to animate your share. <laughs> With all the I'm, time free. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to, by this time next year, you have my word, I'm going to learn how to animate and I'm going to give this talk and it's going to be. You're going from one animal. child to two, right? Yeah. <laughs> She's on to number two now. Yeah. Her head's going to go. Cool. Benny, it's you're doable. Amazing. I can do it. I can do it. I've got like two weeks that I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to learn it in two weeks. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Benny, thanks very, very much indeed for a cracking talk and getting us back into advanced echo teaching. That was brilliant. Thank you. No worries. Anytime. Thank you. Nice one. If you learned something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for watching. watching.